So that's the story. Um, the youngest son of a, a fully Gaelic speaking family. Uh, going away to war, coming back damaged, going away again, getting lost, uh, and returning home to the bosom of the family. Some of this recorded, uh, and uh, what's interesting about that, of course, is that as a Gaelic speaking family, they always spoke Gaelic to each other, but when it came to recording um, significant events or keeping in touch with each other across continents uh, between Canada and Australia, um, they wrote to each other in English. Um, so there's a bilingualism going there which is deeply rooted um, and touches on the most personal things within a family history. So those points um, prompt me to reflect um, with my sort of um, language teaching or researching hat on, um, prompt me to, to ask questions really. Um, and those, they've, they've occupied me uh, for some years now and I've written about them uh, in various articles etc. Um, and uh, these are just some of them. There's a lot on the Island Voices site in, on the research and reports page if you really want to go into detail on this, but I'm going to give you a quick summary and, and, and just highlight one or two, two of these papers um, and, and, and the questions that they raise um, in the context of what it means for well-being. Um, so the first one is short paper, well, a small project that I did in the early days of Sayuchir, over 10 years ago now, looking at learning Gaelic and using Gaelic in um, a bilingual island community, Uist, of course. Um, and I developed that, some of the points coming out of that further in later papers. Um, this one here is based on a talk uh, for that I gave in the in University College London as part of a reading aloud project and I was looking here at the primacy of speech and what I call the, the privileging of literacy. Um, I think there are important questions there which uh, are sometimes uh, glossed over a bit. Um, and then lastly sharing Gaelic voices which hopefully looks forward in a positive manner to some things that, you know, could be done um, to perhaps involving new technology to, to mitigate some of the, the, the serious problems which, which confront uh, Gaelic speakers in, in terms of continuing the use of their own language. Um, so, the first one about uh, Gaelic learning in use in Uist, as I say, I wrote, I, I did a project and there's a quite a long paper. I also wrote a summary of it for Mbappe itself, the, the, the Uist community paper. And there are three themes to this, to this article. One's bilingualism, second is writing, third is speech. Um, and I was interested in bilingualism uh, because we tend to talk about it these days in positive terms, um, in, in terms of additionality. I mean, by definition, uh, if you're bilingual, you've got something extra. Um, but we don't necessarily recognize that always. And that's one thing which came out of uh, this research work that I did, that. Obviously, there are lots of people here in Uist who are naturally bilingual, um, but don't necessarily stop to think about it and actually appreciate what it is that extra that they've got, which uh, many people on the mainland, for example, or other parts of the country who are uh, only monolingual, uh, you know, might, might envy. Um, so this is a positive thing, but we don't necessarily view it that way, is what I'm coming to. And why not? Well. Part of the reason for that may be, I think, 
the mismatch uh, that there is in, in terms of conceptions of what language competence actually is. Um, uh, and the, the fact that many Gaelic speakers don't read or write it is liable, I think, uh, to lead people to actually devalue the Gaelic skills that they have, or undervalue the Gaelic skills that they have. Um, it's a commonplace, and it's kind of language teaching orthodoxy too, that language competence consists of four skills. Speaking, listening, obviously, but also reading and writing. And often it's the reading and writing which are given precedence, um, and to which status is attached. Um, so, uh, if you speak a language well but don't read and write it, you may be prone to think that your your skills are, are less than they should properly be valued as. Um, so, which brings me to speech: the fact that uh, folk Inuit have who have born up, born and brought up in a in a Hebridean family. Uh, speak the Gaelic language naturally um, and that's a resource uh, which could be built upon. Um, I kind of went into a bit more detail on this uh, primacy of speech versus uh, privileging of literacy um, debate in, in the second article and the, the, the point here is that it, it's, it's a, a linguistic orthodoxy now, it has been for over a hundred years, that uh, language, apart from uh, language for uh, sign language, uh, is primarily mediated through speech. Um, and you don't get to learn how to read and write language until after you've learned how to speak it, um, with our first language certainly. Um, and uh, it's not necessarily the case that you do learn to read and write it, um, or even that you need to learn to read and write it. And that's perhaps the most controversial point um, in today's orthodoxies, um, that you're somehow lacking if you don't read and write the language that you speak. Um, and it's partly that that uh, the Island Voices Challenge, uh, project uh, aims to challenge. Uh, through profiling voices in particular in the title and through recording uh, the Gaelic language in speech uh, uh, as a priority over uh, recording it in writing. Um, and uh, there's precedence for this, I think. It goes back centuries in the Gaelic language that uh, probably a majority of its speakers have not read or written it. Um, Yet here it is, we still have it in the 21st century. Um, and just recently I was in Glasgow where I was fortunate to witness a, a marking of the 300th anniversary of the birth of Duncan Brown McIntyre, one of uh, Gaelic's most famous poets, um, a fantastic composer of Gaelic verse who neither wrote uh, nor read the language as far as we know. So winding up, I'm saying that uh, in Uist we have a good knowledge of Gaelic in the, as a rule, comparative terms at least. It's going down, going downhill. Uh, younger people, people, people don't speak it as well as older people. But nevertheless there is a resource here um, and uh, there's potential for sharing uh, in a way that hasn't been possible in the past because we are now living in revolutionary times as far as uh, communication is concerned. We have the internet uh, and we have smartphones um, and these open up all sorts of new possibilities um, which have not been available to previous generations and which allow us to actually reconnect with previous generations um, that, are, that are now past. Um, as we did in uh, one of our workshops where we were listening to a, and discussing a recording 
uh, taken from the Toprum Dulochish site. So there is potential there for technology to be a part of a way forward. Um, and that's an issue which has two aspects to it at least. On, there's an infrastructure aspect to it. Um, there's no point in having um, great internet if you can't access it. So connectivity is there and that's an infrastructural issue. Uh, we might also think of policy frameworks as being part of an infrastructure issue um, that there needs to be to the extent that policy can influence use of language then there needs to be a sympathetic framework for, for the use of Gaelic in, uh, supported in policy terms. Um, but on the individual and, and community side too um, because these other issues are, are in a sense political ones which take collective action uh, and it, it's not fair to just lay it on the backs of individuals to, to, to make progress on that front. But at the individual level uh, what I want to suggest is that there are things that we can all do to help ourselves um, improve or, or safeguard our, our own sense of who we are and uh, therefore our own sense of of well-being um, because we do now have access to means of reinforcing our Gaelic and sharing our Gaelic um, with family, with friends, with the community and, and, uh, and wider still. Um, and that's perhaps where I want to, to leave it, um, that uh, the other Asun survey showed that there was widespread concern across the community about the state of Gaelic in North Uist. That speaks to a well-being issue uh, at community level because this concern is shared not only by Gaelic speakers and Gaelic learners but also by community members who are not Gaelic speakers but nevertheless recognize the importance of Gaelic within the community. Um, and are reluctant to see that resource dwindle and disappear. Um, so Island Voices is, is one way of addressing that to, at, at one level. Um, and it, it's what I've been pushing and I hope that, uh, you know, if there is a connectivity issue, then that's an infrastructural issue uh, which has to be addressed community-wide basis. Um, but the skills issue is another one which we can take on ourselves, I think. Um, not everyone is comfortable with the new technology. They may not feel they have the skills, they may not have the confidence to, to try and learn them. Um, but Drag and drop, copy and paste, uh, I would suggest, um, are things that most people can do these days. Um, and if they can't, they can learn them. And once they've learned them, then they too can be making recordings, um, uh, just like this one. <laughs>